All right, so today I'm going to try to do a bit of an experiment in, uh, in the sense that uh, I am, uh, I'm very excited to see a very hard to explain cryptographic notions make their way into the real world. Uh, and uh, today I'm going to try to do like a small window in the uh, um, research that is happening around SNARKs. I'll try to highlight a brief history of SNARKs, what kind of um, open questions we're working on, and I'll talk about also uh, the state of uh, open source implementations we have for SNARKs. Okay. So, all right. So, briefly, so what what I work on. So, I work in theoretical computer science. So, most most mostly in the areas of complexity theory and cryptography. Uh, but both of these areas touch upon areas of mathematics and security. But what ties them all together in the area that I work on is cryptographic proofs. Okay, perhaps it's not surprising that cryptographic proofs touch areas of mathematics. Mathematics is also about uh, uh, formal proofs. Uh, big, you know, about 100 years ago, uh, mathematicians finally got around to formally defined proof systems. And actually, computer science took this static, non-interactive notions on proof, system, proof systems and uh, reinvented them with randomness and a lot of other more exciting properties like zero knowledge. Perhaps what's less obvious is why do pro cryptographic proofs have to do with security? So let me try to convince you with a proof, I mean, with a proof, uh, with a picture. Uh, <clears throat> so there's a lot of us, and uh, if we have common blockchains that are just sitting there out in the sky that everyone can look at, and we want to try to convince one another of assertions, since we all have different secrets, we need to have some tool to convince each other of these assertions without leaking our secrets. So for example, suppose I want to convince the world that I know a, a secret key that corresponds to a particular public key that's sitting there. Say so that there's an RSA modulus and I want to convince you I know the two primes that uh, make up an RSA modulus. One thing I could do is I could just publish the two primes and say, look, you can go ahead and check it. But that obviously wouldn't work, right? Because you would know now the two primes that make up my public key, right? So instead, I could say, okay, let me just convince you that I know some x, in this case, the two primes, such that both are primes. And moreover, when you multiply them, you add back the RSA modulus, maybe the output y, okay? But the way to do it is, you know, of course, you're not gonna trust me because like, you know, you're in a uh, distributed, I mean, if these are systems that span tr trust boundaries or continents, then you have no idea of uh, whether I'm trustworthy or not. You're gonna have to use a proof for that, okay? So alongside your assertions on the blockchain, you're gonna to want to post proofs that support them, okay? These are publicly verifiable cryptographic proofs that also preserve privacy, okay? This is where proofs maybe um, come in from a security standpoint, okay? So what I'm gonna to try to do now is, I wanna to try to sharpen in your mind the picture of uh, a proof by trying to talk about them slightly more precisely. I think it's, it's I, I would like to hope that I can uh, convey uh, uh, some of these notions more precisely, okay? So in particular, I wanna start with a slide about zero-knowledge proofs. These are what SNARKs are. They're a particular kind of zero-knowledge proof. In layman terms, you can just think about them as privacy-preserving cryptographic proofs of computation integrity. So maybe a lot of you are familiar with data integrity, right? You can think about miracle trees, right? You can, you have the root and then uh, someone, and you push off your data somewhere else and later you wanna retrieve it and you compare, you compare the, um, what someone claims to be like a certain item like using the authentication paths, and right? Maybe you're, you're also familiar with uh, data authentication using like signature schemes, right? But a much harder uh, task is to achieve properties of computation. Computation is not this static data, like it has semantic meaning, okay? So zero-knowledge proofs were introduced uh, by Goldwasser, Mikhail, and Rakov um, in 89. Originally as interactive protocols between two parties, denoted here PMV, what are they? There's a the prover and the verifier, okay? There's a person that wants to convince someone else, that's the prover, and the person that you know, is happy to get convinced is the verifier, okay? And they exchange messages. And <laughs> this will be the only slide with notation the entire talk. Uh, <clears throat> and you can think about the prover knows three things, okay? He knows the function that he has in mind, the claimed output, and his private input. The verifier only has the function and the claimed output, okay? And the verifier wants to know, is it really the case that there exists an X that causes the output Y, right? Is it really the case that you know two primes, P and Q, 
such that when you multiply them, they give the claimed RSA modulus, for example, okay? And to reason about proof system, you need to have several properties. So one property is that of completeness, that if you're trying to prove a true theorem, then you're always be gonna be successful, okay? It says, if it's really the case that you have some X, okay, then the probability that when I interact with you, okay, and I convince you is one, so I can always succeed in convincing you, right? Another property is soundness. It says that I cannot convince you of false claims. Okay, so if it, there isn't P and Q that make up my RSA modulus, okay, I'm not gonna be able to convince you, say with more than a very small probability, okay? And this beautiful property of zero knowledge is also, you know, I was uh, debating whether to even put up any formal definition. I'm still gonna try to, to convey how do we even formalize the property of zero knowledge. I mean, it, it, it's really, not clear a priori how you would say something doesn't leak knowledge, right? And um, sort of one of the amazing contributions of uh, Goldwasser, Mikhail, and Rakov was to actually come up with a mathematical definition of what zero knowledge means. And actually here, here's a very simple rendition of it. It says, look, the verifier by interacting with the prover learns nothing if his view, what is his view? Whatever messages he saw, okay? is a distribution that could have gen been generated to begin with, merely looking at the publicly known outputs. Okay, there's some simulator. Okay, and this is basically saying since, since you can do it yourself efficiently, okay, then interacting with the prover didn't learn, didn't leak any non-efficiently computable information about an input X. Okay, so it's usually how we formalize zero knowledge. Um, I encourage all of you to just try to look it up and learn more about it. It's a really beautiful notion. Uh, I, I personally, uh, many of my friends uh, who are now re researchers in cryptography, they were originally maybe did masters in other fields, but sort of moved to cryptography just because of zero knowledge. So it's, a, it's like a great recruiting tool for the field. <laughs> so, okay, so this is basically state in the 80s. And then Shortly thereafter, people were very interested, okay, just, just, just exactly how efficient can the verifier be? He's just sitting there and uh, he wants to be convinced of a claim, but he's not interested in conducting the computation himself. So people started looking at, okay, can we make the verifier tiny? Okay, maybe he can get convinced without expending many resources, okay? And <clears throat> so people started thinking about the notion of zero knowledge succinct proof, okay? Succinctness simply means that if you're trying to convince me of a very long computation, the pro some F maybe takes a long time to run, but maybe specified as a program is tiny, right? It produces, imagine for example, running a hash function like a million times in a chain, okay? From one original input to an, an output, okay? That's an easy, small, tiny to specify computation, but to actually conduct it, you know, it's, it's a long chain, right? As a verifier, if you convince me of such a computation, would I have to, to run so long, okay? Maybe you can do it uh, with much less. Uh, by, maybe you can run only in time that is related to the specification of the problem, not that it's running time, okay? So this succinctness property you know, was, uh, was studied. It's also uh, something I'll come back to it uh, uh, for SNARKs. It's very important, okay? Because as a verifier, it's not onerous to check claims. Okay, so, People constructed these things. It's an extremely powerful cryptographic primitive. There are two big buts here though. The first one is it's interactive. So from the perspective of the interest of this community, it's not something you can pick and put it on the blockchain, okay? So in particular, if we'd have to convince all of you, I'd have to separately interact with each one of you, okay? So even as a prover, it would be very hard for me. And this interaction is kind of ephemeral. It's not like you can take the transcript of the interaction and put it on the blockchain and let it be convincing. For, for it to be convincing, you would actually have to be talking to me, okay? So that's one syntactical problem with uh, that, uh, um, you know, you cannot just take and use it on the blockchain. A separate problem is that, you know, theoretical computer science, you first study feasibility results and then sort of concrete efficiency is a second concern. Even had been non-interactive, the tools that were used to construct these powerful prim primitives were extremely heavy. So even if asymptotically the proof, you can prove that it's uh, much less than the computation itself, when you actually look at the constants, they're so preposterous that still putting on the blockchain would, would not be a good idea because it would be a pretty large proof. So <clears throat> uh, I want 
of the reasons is that it relies on uh, maybe the second most beautiful tool that we have in theoretical computer science is something called probabilistically checkable proofs, or I'll touch about, uh, upon them again later. But um, are, this is the reason why these things are expensive. Anyhow, so this is what happened in the 90s, and uh, shortly after that, the first SNARK was born. Okay? This was a beautiful paper by Silvio Micali. He got the Turing Award a few years ago for his work in uh, cryptography alongside uh, Shafi Goldwasser. And uh, he had a really nice uh, uh, idea. He was saying, look, uh, it would be really nice to have these things to be non-interactive. So how about we work in something that is called a random oracle model? Okay? This is basically saying, let's assume we have hash functions like SHA-256, and they behave ideally. Meaning, on anything you give it as input, it produces some random looking string. Okay? So and in this model, he was able to prove that yes, we can actually get this succinct zero knowledge proofs to be non-interactive. Okay? So, so this problem of non-interactivity went away. So now we can actually post them to the blockchain. So of course he wasn't thinking about the blockchain, but you know, there are many other applications that care about non-interactivity beyond blockchains. Okay? So it's a natural goal to shoot for. The problem is that he was basically using a prior construction. Essentially, the prover was just thinking in his mind the prior construction and then sort of making it non interactive in his own mind and then shipping it off. So it, it didn't really do any help in terms of concrete efficiency. So we still cannot post it to the blockchain. It's too large. Asymptotically, it's a small proof, but concretely, it would be too large. So that was the state of affair in the 90s. And uh, then kind of things were quiet for about 10 years or so until researchers started getting interested. Okay, so what can we do? Why do we need? So they were not interested in concrete efficiency, by the way. So they were mostly interested. They were bothered by this random oracle. Even though in practice it's not a big deal, you just use cryptographic hash functions. As the theoreticians, we were interested in what are the weakest assumptions we can build with such strong primitives. Okay. And <clears throat> maybe what, what started off like the recent Snark uh, 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 sort of second era was a paper that said, you know, you know what? They're hard to construct. You're not supposed to be able to use standard cryptographic assumptions to build them. There are limitations. Okay? And then this gave courage to a lot of researchers to just go out and start using strong assumptions to build these things. Build, I don't mean like implement, I mean like construct in papers. And uh, a priori, like this was just basically an exercise in what are the weakest cryptographic assumptions we need for constructing SNARKs. Something that unexpected that happens, though, is that in our search for SNARKs that are built on weaker cryptographic assumptions, we came across a kind of SNARK that didn't look so heavy, okay? That we were able to construct using uh, um, tools that were not as preposterous as the full power of probabilistically checkable proofs, but only something that, you know, for whatever reason, it's called linear, linear probabilistically checkable proofs. And this was very interesting. It struck a very interesting trade-off. On, on the one side, these SNARKs were not as asymptotically powerful as the ones that we knew from the 90s, but they were practical today, or at least it looked like they were at least implementable. Okay? So let me give you at least a picture of what does a SNARK look like today that is built. So I'll talk about also a library that we have later on. Um, so it looks like this. It says, yes, we're going to have a non-interactive proof, just like before. But instead of working in a random oracle model, we're going to have some help. Okay? It's going to be, we call this in cryptography, a setup. So you fix your function that you care about, say the RSA, you know, the, the multiplying two primes, uh, as an example. Okay? And before you start using the snark, a trusted party samples some coins, runs a setup procedure that outputs two strings, a very long proving key and a short verification key. Well, this is kind of like a, a key pair, except that both are public. Okay, maybe you're used to key pairs for like digital signatures. There's like a, a public verification key and a private signing key. These are both public, okay? One is for proving, the other is for verification. The, the proving one is long, okay? As long as it takes to compute F, but the verification one is short, okay? Really tiny. And then after you have this help at the beginning, 
Now the prover can use the proving key to prove as many proofs as he wants for different inputs and different outputs. And the verifier can use the verification key to check it. And so you know, over various uh, papers of uh, studying these objects, implementing them, we are at a point where they look great, okay? These proofs are tiny for real, okay? These are the latest, I think it was a construction in April, earlier this year. Proofs are like three group elements, like 128 bytes. This fits in a TCP packet, regardless of how long was the computation that you're asserting to. Think about it as some sort of hash, right? So you can hash a text document uh, of like a megabyte and it still outputs 256 bits. Maybe it's like 100 megabyte document, still 256 bits, okay? So it doesn't matter how long this document, you still have like this constant size hash that depends on the security parameter. Similarly here, you have like this really tiny proof. And you can also check it very fast. I mean, this is like, you know, three pairings. This is like three milliseconds. We ran, we, we were able to run these verifiers on like, you know, crappy smartphones. Like it's, a, it's really, really something you can run on tiny devices. And even the prover is not so bad. So if you think, you know, the question, how is the, there's a bit of an issue of how the function is represented, but think of the functions represented by a circuit, okay? And you have to, like some cost per gate to prove. If your function is, uh, to compute your function takes longer, then your prover takes a longer time. Okay? But roughly the amortized cost is something like this, okay? <laughs> so this actually, so uh, these snacks are actually what underlying uh, uh, um, um, zero cache and also Zcash today is built on uh, these things. And this is basically where we stand today, okay? So there was sort of this uh, 90s uh, a, 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 a initial explorations, but then only very recently we started looking at these things very carefully. And then uh, just by chance, we came across constructions that looked very useful in practice. So I, I, I spent a lot of time working on theoretical foundations and practical implementations of these proof systems, kind of this is where we stand today. So I wanna give an example of like two questions that we're thinking about right now in the academic community. Personally, I'm spending a lot of time on these things. Uh, one problem is um, the prover himself, okay? So this, actually, this, this issue actually doesn't, doesn't come up too much in blockchain computations, because usually you want to assert pretty simple financial invariance. So to begin with, the, function that you, the functions you're interested in asserting are not that complicated. But there are a lot of other interesting examples where you do want to prove in a privacy preserving way, large computations. Here's an example. Say that you have like some medical data, data set and you want to build, you know, do a, you run a training algorithm on it to construct a public classifier for maybe doing diagnosis, okay? And you want the classifier that came out of this training on a private data to be used by other people, okay? Ideally, this classifier would come along with a proof that says, look, the classifier was computed correctly on the data but you want the proof to not leak information about the data itself, right? That seems like you want a zero-knowledge proof. But guess what, we cannot do it today because data is large, the computation is large, and this prover, even though it has great amortization, at some point it runs out of space in a single machine and hits memory bounds, and then the amortization property goes out the window because it starts thrashing to disk. So it's extremely memory intensive. That's a big problem. We, cannot, we can use effectively today SNARKs for tiny, simple financial assertions like in zero cash, but we cannot use them for like, you know, big data. Another major problem that I think a lot of you are sensitive about is this trapdoor, okay? We got this boost of um, getting something practical today by having some setup help, okay? And so actually when I, so I was a PhD student at MIT, I spent many years working on these things. Back then I wasn't so worried, oh, whatever, like it's a, we, we call this setup in cryptography a common reference string. We do it all the time, right? But it didn't dawn on me just how messy it is to deploy these systems in the real world, especially on planetary scale. Who sets up the, <laughs> who sets up the public parameters? Who samples this trapdoor? It's really not clear, okay? So, yeah, there's some mitigations you can do. For example, we had a paper. This is actually the approach that Zcash is going to take this time around. We designed a tailored multi-party protocol for generating the public parameters so that you actually have to corrupt all of the parties participating in the protocol in order to actually corrupt the entire setup, okay? But I mostly view this as a mitigation. And uh, more generally, a, you know, we, need, we need to like, get rid of this uh, setup, okay? And let me tell you about you know, what, I've, what I've been doing about each of these things. So more recently, 
um, to tackle the memory intensive, uh, the memory bottlenecks have been working on distributed ZK snark generation. So, and the idea is that you take, take the prover algorithm, don't run it on a computer. Let's say, let's try to run it on a computer cluster, okay? So now the prover is not anymore sitting on a particular machine. It's just the collective, collective action of a lot of compute nodes that are connected by a network, okay? And so uh, we have work in progress also with uh, Howard here, he's an uh, undergrad uh, at uh, UC Berkeley. And we've been working on a scalable uh, implementation of the prover on Apache Spark, which is you know, one of the premier sort of frameworks for running computation computer clusters. And we're building sort of the, the, the scalable um, implementation of the basic algorithmic core of, of uh, SNARKs so that we can actually put an entire prover running uh, on a cluster. And you know, just to give you like some numbers, like for example, on a computer today, the prover is it maybe able to prove you know, 10, 20 million gates with it before exploding. Um, but ideally we'd like to scale up to prove statements uh, about, of computations that involve maybe a billion or 10 billion gates. Okay, so it's something more serious and more, uh, more complex computations in zero knowledge. All right, so uh, how about the trapdoor? How are we ever gonna deal with this problem? Like, it's a, that's a really serious issue, and uh, even though maybe Zcash, you know, since I've been really involved with Zcash since the beginning, you know, as a, as a co-founder, as also a scientific advisor, okay, they can, they, maybe they can do multi-party computation. They have the resources and the privilege to, 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 to try to do something as sophisticated, sophisticated as multi-party computation. But I have the aspiration that any half-interesting SNARK application could just take off on its own, and this really requires no trapdoors, okay? Because uh, if you weren't there to witness the birth of an application, why would you trust its setup, right? So, so what was really the problem you know, with the 90s snarks of uh, Mikali? They were using this probabilistically checkable proofs. Let me even give you a picture of what they look like. Well, you know, what is a probabilistically checkable proof? It's a sub-proof system that the snark prover has in his mind, okay? And it's kind of like running in his mind and then produces a tiny proof for you. And this subproof system works as follows. It says there is a prover and it produces like a non-interactive proof, but it's very long, okay? And the verifier samples it at random. That's why it's called a probabilistically checkable proof. If we had good constructions of these things, we have them, they're symptotically good, but they're, they're very heavy. They use very heavy tools for mathematics and they're very hard to analyze. We have suboptimal constructions. It's, uh, it's ongoing research. Recently, together with uh, um, other authors, we've been exploring a, a wider design space. We call it, you know, probabilistic checking with interaction, which basically says, let's consider snark constructions that start with basically an interactive protocol where the proven verifier exchange sort of these probabilistically checkable proofs over an interaction. And can we do something better here? First and foremost, we were able to prove that you can still construct snarks out of this more general starting point. But this wider design space, we were able to prove that it gives you a lot more efficiency. You get zero knowledge cheaper. And sort of over the past you know, year and a half too, we've been, we've been laying the theoretical foundations for this more general object. And personally, I trust and I'm really working hard towards uh, in the future, maybe in the next few years, having laid the theoretical foundations of uh, uh, these more general types of VCPs to come back and say, okay, look, now we can actually construct SNARKs without chapters, okay? But you know, this is like a research program, it's gonna take some time. There's a, there's a lot of technical work needs to be done. Okay, so this is just a couple of, uh, an example of uh, questions that uh, I think about. So in, in parallel to this, we've been uh, spending a lot of time with technology transfer, uh, with not many resources. Main, main, I mean, this is mostly stuff that, uh, my office mates and I were writing late at night at MIT, so, but uh, it, still, it still seems to have caught on. We were able to put together uh, a, a library for the ZK snarks of today. They have trapdoors, but at least they're practical. And I just wanted to give you like a picture of like what's inside this library and like uh, where do we want to take it. So uh, it's a deep stack. There's a lot of algorithms going here. There are things for all the way from finite field arithmetics to implementing elliptic curves, like we built all of this ourselves, specialized for SNARKs. Um, there's a lot of backends, depending upon whether you represent your function as an arithmetic circuit or as a Boolean circuit, and uh, there are different kinds of SNARKs, depending upon 
how your function is represented. Zero-cash, for example, directly uses an arithmetic circuit. So the financial invariants in zero-cash that are asserted, we hand wrote them in an arithmetic circuit, and then we invoke a backend that we constructed. But you can also imagine sort of more human-friendly um, uh, front-ends, basically, that uh, expose to you a microarchitecture. So we had this work where we put together a risk machine, okay, some simple assembly language. If you write your program in the simple assembly language, you were able to prove its correct execution and zero knowledge, okay? And these were basically front-ends with sort of careful reductions from uh, uh, correctness of um, program executions to arithmetic circuits. And uh, as I mentioned, the, the, the numbers that I mentioned are related to a really nice paper of Jens Groth that, uh, that was uh, published earlier this year. Uh, he was building on some of our earlier work that's currently you know, state-of-the-art SNARK today. It's implemented also in LibSnark, you can find it there. And we're also working on uh, some uh, other applications. Uh, we're currently working on a paper on privacy-preserving micropayments, also on privacy-preserving marketplaces like that have a, a, like Amazon with uh, reviews tied to actual purchase, purchases. Uh, so that in parallel to this fundamental SNARK research, we're exploring exp applications with what we can already do. Okay. So also I want to say that uh, <laughs> it's. Uh, I, we, ha we have more ideas that we have time for. So if you have you know, skills and algorithms uh, or uh, 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 time, uh, we also put up uh, uh, some Google form if you want to get in touch. Uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, programming <laughs> um, mini projects, or I don't know if it's so mini, but uh, uh, there, if you want to contribute to Snarks, we're open uh, to, uh, 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 to, you know, to collaborate because the, there is just also, now as a professor, I don't really have as time as I used to before as a student, before I could just hack on things. Now I have to advise students, I have to teach, I have to write grants, I don't have time anymore to write all this code. But still, there's still a lot of things that we want to do for Lipsnark in order to further facilitate technology transfer. And uh, so we're looking for uh, uh, people with uh, good skills and algorithms and some knowledge of cryptography. So, so yeah, like I'm in the... <clears throat> Very excited about uh, uh, getting the knowledge proofs to practice. Uh, this uh, uh, blockchains are really a, blockchains and cryptographic proofs are really a match made in heaven, right? So, because you have this blockchain, it's public. You cannot put all of your information there, okay? So some of it is going to have to be private, okay? But you have to still have to convince to other people that this private information means something to them, right? So you have to use your large proofs, and you have to be non-interactive. They cannot be large, because otherwise the blockchain, blockchain explodes, okay? So this, uh, using snarks in blockchains is like beautiful application, but uh, uh, I'm sure there's still a lot to be said in terms of applications, and I'm generally interested to hear about use cases, because uh, you know, I cannot keep track of everything. There's like more applications that uh, that I know about. Uh, thinking about payments is easy, but uh, I'm sure there's like less obvious applications. I'm happy to hear about them. And uh, I think that's all I have for today. Thank you. Okay, let's <clears throat> let's let's start with with one question. Uh, thank you for your talk. So I have a quick question about the uh, distributed prover. Um, I'm guessing, so you farm out the proving computation to lots of machines. I'm guessing you have to then put the secret input on all of those machines in order for them to yes. correctly do it? Yeah, I mean, okay. Let's say uh, to a first uh, approximation, yes. In particular, uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the trust boundary from the prover's perspective includes the entire cluster. Okay, uh, one, more, one more question. <clears throat> so w one thing I'm very interested in doing in SNARKs is not just uh, privacy, but also a form of uh, compression, uh, being able to, instead of downloading an entire blockchain, being able to just get a SNARK that says, this is the current state of the blockchain. Uh, to do that, we need efficient recursive SNARKs. Uh, when do you think we're gonna get those? Uh, what well, first? Uh, <laughs> so, so in my mind, kind of, we kind of already made in almost uh, in 2012. We first proved uh, sort of this recursive composition theorem for SNARKs. 
Two years later, we had an implementation of them. Uh, it's not exactly the fastest, but it's much faster than I had ever imagined. Like I, I would never have guessed in 2012 that two years later we would have had the implementations of, of uh, recursive composition of SNARKs. The main obstruction to getting even further efficiency is the use of uh, pairings. Uh, in recursive composition of SNARKs, you need to assert that the previous verification was correct. So what happens is that you need to represent the verifier as a circuit itself, right? And so you need the verifier to be, you know, it's fast, it's three milliseconds, but a lot of things happen in a processor in three milliseconds, right? So in terms of elementary gates, these SNARKs are maybe you know, 200,000 gates, okay? Can it be down, can, be, can it be reduced to like 10,000, 50,000 gates? That would be the kind of things that would help a lot recursive composition of SNARKs. It depends on whether we can construct SNARKs without pairings. These are related to information theoretic uh, conjectures I'm working on. Yeah, but I like that question. I, I love recursive composition of SNARKs. We make great strides, but they're still not to the point where we want to use them in practice. Okay, let's, let's thank Alessandro. Yeah.